Okay, we've got 1.30. Why don't we get started? Good afternoon, research methods. That's, that's pretty good for week 10. Sounding pretty good. I hope you had a restful weekend. I hope you caught up on some sleep, as always. We're going to be moving into a new topic this week. We'll be talking about independent samples ANOVA, and looking forward to that. Uh, lots of videos. There's a video that was already presented there for today, and we have one ready to go for tomorrow. Uh, and then on Wednesday, we'll spend a lot of time, and on Friday, doing some hands-on exercises. We might do a little bit of that today and tomorrow but we'll spend most of our time on Wednesday and Friday doing hands-on computations. I've already posted the video also for November 4th, so we have the next several days uh, ready to go for our videos. Okay, really good. Uh, first, regarding the exam that we just had the other day, several people did really well. Congratulations to those of you who did really well. Other folks struggled a little bit. Uh, so hang in there. You shouldn't feel bad about that. We take this one step at a time, and it's not too uncommon for people to struggle a bit on the, the second of our tests. The information does start to accumulate, and you, you shouldn't feel like, gee, you're the only person to whom this is happening. This actually happens just about every semester, uh, just about every college, when you're doing the, the second test in a research methods or a stats class. It happens uh, pretty frequently. So again, congratulations to those who did well. For those of you who struggled a little bit, hang in there. I, I wonder if we might do this to help us prepare a little more effectively for the next time. Um, this is not a pop quiz, but I wonder if I can ask you to take out a sheet of paper and um, you can, you know, I won't even ask you to put your name on it. This is not for a grade. just want to see how we might promote what we would call metacognition. And while we're waiting for people to pull out their blank sheet of paper, and I don't need a name on it, I don't need a slate of box, can somebody remind us what metacognition is? Metacognition? Okay, why don't we go with Mira? Thinking about thinking, right? So part of this is uh, that we do metacognition all the time. You'll be engaged in metacognition well after you graduate from Denison. It's important in all of your classes. Uh, on the one level, you've got cognition. What do you know about the material in any one of your classes? Okay, that's regular cognition. And we're concerned about that. We're also concerned about metacognition. How well are you thinking about what you know? And there's some really interesting work that psychologists do on that. Cognitive psychologists frequently look at metacognitive issues. And they ask how well you can estimate how well you're doing in a class or how well you think you did on an exam. Sometimes people do very well on an exam and they think they bombed. Okay? And when that happens, we know that their metacognition is off. Other times they think that they did really, really well and they actually bombed. Again, their metacognition is off. Um, sometimes you bomb and you know that you bombed. Right? You can feel it. Right? Then your metacognition is right on. Sometimes you're doing really well and you know that you're doing really well. So to help you maybe direct your intellectual energies, we'll try to home in a little bit just on your metacognition. This is not for any points. But what I might ask you is to reflect on this just for a moment. How might you prepare differently for the next exam if, in fact, you want to prepare differently for the next exam. Some people did very well, and maybe you don't. But just think about how might you prepare differently. I'm interested in how you reflect on that. Um, you can put down a couple of sentences. Okay? I won't call on you. This can be um, something that it's almost like a note to yourself and a note to me that's done anonymously. And I would like to see how people reflect on this. When you're done, I wonder if you can put them face down on the back table.
No names, right? No Slater box numbers. Just trying to get a feel for how students are thinking about their own thinking. <coughs> If you're still finishing up, that's all right. That we, we might move on. Just to offer a, a brief reflection, um, metacognition is thinking about thinking, and that can be thinking about one's own thinking. It can also be thinking about somebody else's thinking. So as professors, we do this all the time. We think about our, our students' thinking, and we, we're always trying to gauge that. So some of the things that I always try to do for my students is uh, I always try to see how far can I go to help them learn the material without actually you know, feeding them the fish, just uh, sort of teaching them how to fish. And some of the things I try to do are offer those multicolored uh, answer keys that are, that are available to you. I make my PowerPoints available to you, and I do the videos, hoping that might help you acquire this information, which I think most people find is fairly difficult information. This isn't very easy stuff. I know that, uh, I, again, across the nation, a lot of students really dread a a stats related course. Um, so we, we, I'm trying to make that as, uh, as easy as I might make it. So that's how I, I reflect on some of my own thinking, uh, some, how I reflect on what students might be thinking about and how I can help them. So that's my, my little piece. I look forward to reading what you have to say about your own metacognition. Thank you for, for that. Uh, okay, and as I said, um, really the tests were uh, fine for some folks, a little bit lower than some folks might have wanted. So why don't we do this? Why don't we now take out another sheet of paper and we won't have a pop quiz. We'll make this an extra credit opportunity such that if you blow it and you don't get anything on it, you don't lose any points. But you have a chance to make some points, okay? Chance to make some points here. So for those who did well on the test, now you're gonna go like way over the top perhaps. And for those who didn't do so well, we, we can bring that back up into a range that's a little bit more like what you would like to see. Okay. So if you now, because this one is four points, but only positive points, you can't lose anything here. If you would put your Slater box number, I don't need to know uh, names, just Slater box. We'll grade it that way. Okay. And what we'll do is we'll put this question into the context of today's PowerPoint presentation, what you read for today, and uh, the video that you saw for today. Uh, and so we're talking about the independent samples ANOVA, and um, here's my question to you. The extra credit question is, if the ANOVA had a theme song, what would it be? If the ANOVA had a theme song, what would it be? Spelling doesn't count. And uh, you can jot down your answer, put it face down, so if the ANOVA had a theme song, what would it be? <laughs> yeah, so, so maybe that question doesn't, ma doesn't mean anything to you. And if, if it doesn't mean anything to you, uh, maybe you'll have trouble earning the points. But I actually was looking for a particular song. <laughs> it does, just face down right over there, please. Yeah, thank you. If the ANOVA had a theme song, what would it be? And we'll make that like the typical extra credit points are worth a 10 out of zero. So if you, if you didn't get it, no harm done. If you got it, then it looks like it'll be 10 points for you. So good for you. Okay, anybody else? Collect all of these. Thank you, Hannah. Is this one? Yeah, I think that's that one. I'll figure it out. Th those are those should be sufficiently different. Oh, okay. Uh, that's all right. That's all. I'll, I'll find them. I know two stacks here. Yeah, they, they should be pretty different ideas, unless uh, your metacognition also takes the form. Your metacognition also takes the form of a theme song, which would be interesting. I'll give you points for creativity here. Thank you. Do you have yours also? Wow. 
All right. All right. Do I have all the responses? Anybody want to remind us what our theme song might be? Yell it out if you know it. One of these things is not like the others. Wow. All right. <laughs> wow. Okay. So unless that was your metacognition, I'll figure out which was which in, uh, in, the, in the stack. Okay. All right. We'll put that into some context later on. One of these things is not like the others. Okay. That's our, that's our theme song. How many people have heard that one before? One of these things, or maybe you never heard it with, within the context of ANOVA, but uh, I, I think PBS and Sesame Street should be talking about ANOVAs. If, if I had my way, uh, we'd have ANOVAs on, uh, on PBS <laughs> and Sesame Street. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about these three ideas that we saw in the video. There's the conceptual introduction to ANOVA. That's an analysis of variance. Then we'll talk a little bit about the equal variance assumption. That's an old friend of ours. Nothing particularly new there, although it rears its head again, especially in the ANOVA. And today I'd like to go into a little bit more depth than we had done previously, maybe even a little bit more depth than we did in the video. And then we'll talk about some brand new problems that rear their heads very, for the very first time once we start talking about ANOVAs. And these are cumulative type 1 error and something called post hoc tests. Okay? So why don't we do it this way? Uh, why don't we uh, let you peruse through this as you need to, and we'll see if you can write down here what was clear and what was not so clear, please, only on the first section. Can we just try to limit our responses? I'll go to the view, to this first section, which is on independent samples ANOVA, a conceptual introduction. Okay, so we'll take it one step at a time. We'll have you jot down what you thought was really clear or unclear. You might have already done this. Hopefully, people who watched the video made their notes. And we'll just go this far. Slides one through, let's see, 29. Again, your metacognition is improved if you write down both what is clear and what is unclear. Those big pie chart kinds of things that are green and red, and we'll, we'll see them in green and red up here in, in just a moment, okay? All right, so we'll come to that. Um, why don't we uh, try out this way? Maybe we'll give folks just a, another moment or two to jot down something, but we'll have to come back to um, the pie chart, okay? All right. And thank you for that question, because that's going to come up a whole lot in future sessions. We're going to be coming back to that thing time and time again, so it would be great if everybody had a really good foundation in that. I wonder if I can start us out this way. I wonder, does anybody want to share something in these first 29 slides that was actually quite clear? Hopefully something that isn't trivial. <laughs> something that uh, is maybe something that a person off the street wouldn't know, but you learned by either doing the readings or doing the PowerPoints or watching the video. Uh, something that was clear to you. You found these first 29 slides. Okay, we'll go with Katie. Okay, wow, the different heights of the bars versus the different sizes of the error bars. Okay, so here's a generic graph. This can be on any variable. We'll go with a dependent variable here on our y-axis. And then we'll have our IV here. And we'll just pretend that we have two groups. We'll call them group A and B. Okay, maybe one is a control group. One is an experimental group. Okay? And when we're talking about some of the between group variability, we might say that we can have a difference in means between group A and group B. Okay. So there's some variability there. One group has a high mean, one group has a low mean. Right? So there's some between group variability. Okay. It wouldn't have to be that way. There could be very little between group variability, just like this, if they were at the same height. If I were to extend group B up to A's level, or equivalently bring A down to B's level, there would be no variability between those two means. Who's following that? 
Okay, so that's, that's one source of variability. And then as Katie was correctly pointing out, what we could have is some error bars, and that's going to be with the within condition or the within group variability. And we can have very low levels of variability within each of those conditions. It might look something like that. Okay. So relatively narrow er uh, error bars. Or we can have really large amounts of error associated with each of these conditions. They go way up, they come way down. Okay. So that's one of the ways of thinking about the between group versus within group variability. How different are the means from each other versus how much variability do we have within any one of the conditions? Who's following that? Anybody have a question on that? So that was clear to Katie, but that might not have been clear to some other folks who are watching that. Please go ahead, Mira. Thank you. Okay, so when we're comparing A to B, that's between, these are different groups, group A and group B. Okay, so if we're comparing A's mean to B's mean, we're comparing between the groups. If we throw B out of the picture just for a moment and we ask about the variability within A, that's going to be given by this error bar. If we throw A out for a moment and we look just at B, we can figure out how much variability there is on B's error bar. Okay? So the mean is going to be an indicator of central tendency for each of these groups, and we can ask how different those means are from each other. That's the between group. And then how much variability does that have? Okay? Yeah. Something else. Anything else clear on the first 29 slides that we had? This is our introduction, our conceptual introduction. Because in not too, uh, the not-too-distant future, we'll be doing some computation. And we hate for you to just to be putting in numbers that don't mean anything to you. Right? We want you to sort of understand how these tie back to real-world issues and uh, graphs that we might be able to draw. Something else. Maddie's got something. Um, I thought how you explained the difference between the ANOVA and the T-test. OK, so the distinction between the ANOVA and the T-test was quite clear. Do you want to help us with that or get us started on how those are different? Great, nicely stated. So the t-test can be used to compare a maximum of two means. Okay, so we could use a t-test here if we were so inclined. Right? We, we could do that. Uh, we could also use an ANOVA here because we're using an ANOVA to compare means. We use a t-test to compare means. But if we have many, many means, most importantly here, if we have more than two means, we really can't use a t-test anymore. T-test is really best at, or can only be used to compare a maximum of two means. But if we're using an ANOVA, we can compare two or more. And there's no upper limit on that. It could be hundreds or thousands of means. Okay? Hopefully, you will never be in a study where there are thousands of means that have to be compared. But if, if there were such a study, uh, the ANOVA could handle it. Right? There's no upper limit to that. Okay? I want to take one more point of clarity, and then we'll move over to some uh, points of unclarity. Anybody else find something clear here in the first... 29 slides. Okay, thanks, Annalie. Um, it makes seem trivial about those different sources of variability. So, like, the treatment effect, the individual differences. Okay, let's go to that one. There was three. I think it's that guy. Sometimes I just know these by almost like sight reading. Okay? So, when we're talking about how scores vary, we can think about what contributes to that variability. And there's the one that's really of interest to you and me, and that's the top one here. That's called the treatment effect. And so whatever study we might be running, we're usually interested in one particular variable. We'll call that the independent variable. We want to know, uh, for example, to what extent that might be driving the dependent variable or influencing the dependent variable. And that might be something like we have different therapies that we're using. These might be cognitive behavioral therapy. It might be psychoanalysis. There might be pharmacological manipulations. Uh, what is our treatment? If, if we're working with children who are having difficulty reading, right, we can try different kinds of uh, reading training programs. Okay? That might be our treatment effect. We're hoping that that will drive the scores, okay? that we get some kind of an improvement. That's what we're hoping for. But we also know that sometimes the scores vary for other reasons, and that brings us to these other two components. There are individual differences. Right? If we take a baseline measure on the reading test, a baseline measure on any kind of test that you like, we're going to find that maybe no two of you perform exactly the same. There are individual differences that we might have. We also have something more generally called experimental error. And that is that we'd like to know about the population, but we have to take a sample. And the samples are going to be randomly drawn, and some of the samples will have higher means, some of the samples will have lower means, right? So there's some random variability that's driving the scores. We also get some random variability driven by the fact that our instruments are typically not so reliable. 
right? I mean, they, they have some level of measurable reliability, but they also have some unreliability associated with them. Even something like a, a bathroom scale, if you were to measure very carefully, I could step on and off. I will get roughly the same weight two times in a row, but I might not get exactly the same weight. So if we have some variability in our instruments, some variability in who's getting sampled, we're going to have some changes in the scores that have absolutely nothing to do with whether our treatment effect is working or not working. Who's following that? Does that work for us? Okay, so those things were clear. So why don't we now go back and give you the chance to think about what was not so clear? Okay, and maybe uh, I can start us off because I think we've already had one. So Jenna brought one up, and that was about these multicolored pie charts. Is that right, Jenna? Okay. Okay, so this is the one that we want to deal with now. Okay, and if you've got the items in front of you on your computer screen, uh, this will stand out like a sore thumb. If you don't mind, I'll turn down one of these. Is that better in the back? Okay, and that helps a little bit. All right, so what I'd like to do in a moment when I bring the lights back up is write the equation again for the F statistic. Can anybody give us the general equation for the F statistic? What is the ratio that we're typically looking for? Okay, thanks, Jenner. Right, the between group variability over the within. So we just drew that a moment ago. What's the between group difference? Uh, and that's the difference in the means versus how big are those error bars? And we're trying to show that here by these, this color coding that we have. The between group variability is shown in green, and there's a rhyme to be had there. The between is in green, and the within subject variability is shown here in red. Okay, so um, now Jenna's earlier question was, well, why do we have this big circle? How does it relate to the sum of squares? Okay, all I'll ask you to think about there is that you can imagine having a list of numbers that generates a really large sum of squares. Okay? It just it happens to have a really big value for the SS. Here's another list of numbers, and it has a relatively small sum of squares associated with it. So we can have a lot of variability as measured by SS or a little bit of variability as measured by SS. The SS is one of our measures of dispersion. Show of hands, who remembers that, that the sums of squares was a measure of dispersion? Does that work for us? Okay, so it's not a measure of central tendency, which would be mode, median, and mean. Uh, the SS is going to get us to the variance, which gets us to the standard deviation, so it's related to the dispersion. So we can talk about how dispersed are the scores, and we can say that they're dispersed like this, or they're dispersed like that, or they're dispersed like that, and what I mean by that is we have a lot of variability or not so much. Who's okay with that? Okay. That if we had a lot of variability, we'd have a really big pie. Now, whether we have a big pie or a small pie or any size pie that you might imagine, we can begin to partition that pie into different sources of variability. We talked about three different sources a moment ago, but now what we're going to do is try to figure out how much of that variability might be fairly attributed to the between group differences. So we had a moment ago, I think Katie pointed out, group A versus group B. We'll do it this way. Here's group A way up top. Here's group B with a much lower mean. How much of the variability can be attributed to those mean differences between the groups versus how wide are those error bars? And if we have really, really wide error bars, that would mean that this red area would be relatively large. If we have really, really different means, this green area would be large. Here's a case where we have identical means, okay, and we also have relatively large error bars, so to speak. Okay? And this might be even bigger error bars. So that would mean that we have a really large red area because we have a lot of within subject variability. Uh, if we have maybe small error bars and we have the means be very, very different in this direction or very, very different in that direction, now the means are very different, which is to say that the groups are different from each other on average, and that's going to give us a lot of between group variability. Okay, so the scores in the experimental group might be a lot higher than the scores in the placebo group, so to speak. Okay, so we would then have a relatively large green area. Let me pause there and check in with Jenna to see if that works. Does that help? Okay, really good. That's a great question. So when we're talking about the ANOVA, we're analyzing the variance. And you might remember that to get the variance, we have to go through the sums of squares thing. We can put all the sums of squares into one big pie and then start chopping it up based on where we think that variability is coming from. Okay. All right. Let me turn these lights back on just for a moment before I lose you. I know it's in the afternoon and people sometimes uh, get a little sleepy. I would too. Uh, why don't we go and spend another moment or two and ask what else might be unclear in these first 29 slides before we get up to the next section on equal variance. Happy to entertain any questions that are most relevant to you.
Okay, go ahead, Natalie. Thank you. Okay, really good. Let me see if I can find that one. Something like this, uh, individual differences. Is that where we are, Natalie? Okay, yeah. So, is there a specific question or shall I just try to explain this one? Yeah, I was wondering if you could explain Okay, it. right, so as Jenna mentioned a moment ago and as we saw on our slide, you can think of this F statistic as being the between group variability over the within group variability. If we wanted to take a microscope, metaphorically speaking, and zoom in on the between group variability, which is in the numerator, or zoom in on the within group variability, which is in the denominator, what might we find? And what we might find is that we have these three sources of variability up in the numerator. That is, that the treatment effects could be driving differences between the groups. Let's say Prozac really is working, and it really does elevate mood way up here, and then the placebo doesn't elevate mood. We'd wind up with a really big between group difference in our numerator because of our treatment effect. Is that much working for you? Okay, right? That, that wouldn't affect the within group variability all by itself, right? That would, that would affect the differences between these two groups. Now, uh, the other factors are still there inside of the people who were randomly, inside of the group that was randomly assigned to receive the on the drug, uh, we'll call it Prozac in this case, we're still going to have some individual differences. Right? We're still going to have some measurement error in our, uh, in our instruments for measuring depression in this case. Uh, so it's not just that the only factor that we have to deal with is treatment effects. So we acknowledge that all of that is in there, um, but the treatment effects would be, a, would be altering the, uh, the means between the, the conditions. Does that work for you? Okay. Yeah, how do we get the numbers for treatment effects, right? Um, so here is, and that's a great question, right? Here is a conceptual introduction. I'm showing you that there's some numerator, there's some denominator. Qualitatively, what's in the numerator, what's in the denominator? Uh, the way that we pull that out is by getting to an F summary table and trying to figure out um, how the sums of squares might be partitioned uh, between groups versus within groups. We'll introduce something called basic ratios that will help us do that. But before we get into whether we do exponentiation first, addition, subtraction first, I wanted us all to have a feel for what really goes into this F statistic intuitively. Okay? All right, great. Okay. One other thing, just to set the stage a little bit, this is something we don't have a, uh, a slide for, but it is something that I show in the video. Here is the distribution for the F statistic. Let's see if we can have you generate an answer to this question. What other statistic is roughly shaped this way? We've done one more this semester, one earlier one that has a similar shape. Anybody remember what that was? Chi-square? Okay, yeah, the chi-square was also positively skewed. So some of the stats that we're looking at, when you plot them, uh, they have a positive skew. Others have this, uh, this more of a normal shape, a symmetrical shape. Okay? And the F statistic so happens to be normally shaped, uh, as is the chi-square statistic. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to why this would have the, the positive skew? Why it would start at zero, for example? Any notion about why this starts at zero? It's a tougher question. It goes from zero to positive infinity. We have a critical value. Maybe Mirror's got an insight. It's because you can't have a negative, like if you square a number, you can't have negative. That's right. So uh, as you'll see in just a little while, we're going to be working with sums of squares. We're going to be partitioning the, sum, partitioning the sums of squares, and those are always going to be either zero or positive, but they can't be negative, at least not in the real number system. Just out of curiosity, how many people have seen or heard of the imaginary number system where you've got, yeah, okay, yeah, that sounds familiar, right? where you actually could uh, square a number and wind up with a, a negative, right? You can have the square root of negative one is that I imaginary number, but we're, we're going to stay away from that. That's a different branch of mathematics. In the real number system, whenever you're squaring something, you're going to wind up with a non-negative number. It could be zero, but it can't be negative. So we're going to start at zero and go all the way out this way. Okay, really good. All right, all right, so I think we're okay on that. Why don't we uh, go on to our next section? Our next section was all about equal variance, and we've seen this before. Let's all yell out, what is the name of the statistic that we use to evaluate equal variance? Levine? Who remembers that from last time around, the Levine test? Okay, so Levine is still here again and works roughly the same way. Okay, we'll let you take a look at this, and this is a small section. It only goes from slide number 30 to slide number 35. Why don't we let you look over that Maybe you've already made notes on what was clear or not so clear. We'll have you jot something down and we'll take either clarity or lack of clarity on the equal variance assumption.
Okay, not seeing anything just yet. I wonder if we can do a little exercise, right? Um, so here's an exercise. I wonder if we can assume that we've got a graph for a, a study that has two groups, group A and group B. It doesn't really matter to me what's on the, uh, the dependent variable axis, the y-axis. Can you draw a graph that would uh, likely show, using that A and B, that would, that would likely show um, uh, what would be the case if it turned out that we had a really low sig value a really, really low sig value for our Levine test. So if the Levine test had a really, really low sig value, what would our two-bar graph look like? Right, so we have some dependent variable, group A, group B. And what would the rest of that graph look like if we had a really low sig value? We'll call it even sig equals zero, zero, zero. Inside of our Levine test. See if you can think that through. And if you think you've got a response, it doesn't really matter whether it's correct or incorrect. Can I just see somebody raise a hand if you think you've got something? Okay, maybe if we get a couple of po folks responding, we'll check in. Because what I was going to do would be to invite some folks to go either to the front board or the back board and, and draw their, uh, their guess as to what these things might look, at, look like. It doesn't matter to me whether you're correct or incorrect. This is just practice. As we said earlier, this is rehearsal time, right? We watch the video, we come in and re rehearse. So we'll see if anybody wants to give that a go. Would anybody like to come up to the board? You can do backboard if you want or front board. Any, any volunteers? Another possibility is if you'd rather not come up because you're shy, you can direct me. I'll be happy to be under your direction. I'll let you tell me what to put in the graph. Why don't we do it that way? It doesn't look like we have any eager beavers just yet. We'd like to get to the point where we, uh, we, we can do that. We can use this more as a hands-on rehearsal. But I'll give you this much. Okay, here is the plot. It goes DV. We have two groups, A and B. And the question again is, what would this thing have to look like if we put uh, two columns on here, one for A, one for B? What would this thing have to look like if it were the case that our Levine statistic had a sig value that was really, really low. Anybody want to hazard a guess what this might look like? Okay, thanks, Kip. That's really good, okay? The margin of error would be very different. So it really wouldn't matter how high we were to draw this mean. The mean could be just about anything. I'll make them the same just for uh, simplicity. Okay. And now what we have is a really small variance on one of them, doesn't matter which, I'll call it A. And then I've got this huge variance on B. Remember that the Levine statistic is all about the equality of variance. Sometimes we call this the homogeneity of variance. So here we have identical means, but that's not what Levine is testing. Levine is testing this dispersion component. We have really small dispersion here, and we have huge dispersion there. Show of hands how many people are following that graphically. Okay? So we have wildly different variances there. We don't have equal variance, so we'd have to reject the equal variance assumption, and that indication would be shown in SPSS by having a really low sig value. Remember, our rule about sig values is when they're less than 0.05, we reject something. In this case, we'd wind up rejecting an assumption about equal variance because these variances are surely not equal. Okay? All right. One more time. How many people are following that? Okay. So we could have done almost anything we wanted with the means. The critical feature there would be how similar are the variances to each other. Okay, that's, that's the main idea. Okay, now here's one of the hardest critical thinking questions of the semester. I'm going to really ask you to try to think this one through. Any idea why we prefer to have equal variances? Why do we prefer to have equal variance? So, so we don't proceed typically with the ANOVA unless we have equal variance. And we use Levine as an indicator to tell us whether it's safe to proceed or not so safe to make that assumption. Kip, do you have an idea about that? This might not answer why as much as you're thinking, but um, in order to conduct the ANOVA test, you need to meet the equal variance assumption. Yeah, OK. So we do need to make the equal variance assumption. And Levine tells us, yep, we made it, or no, we didn't, and we use the 0.05. So, so that's a really good start. I think Brittany also had a hand for him. Yeah.
Okay, right. So we do have to do this as a first step, right? We have to see if that assumption is satisfied. Let me see if I can rephrase the question. Why do we make that assumption in the first place? Right? So you're correct that we, now that we've told you, we're, we're teaching you that we have this assumption. Uh, it probably wasn't the case that a bunch of statisticians stat sat around and said, hey, you know, we don't have anything to do today. Why don't we just put on this equal variance? Why would they bother with an equal variance assumption? Right? So you're right that we have to check it out. We have to use Levine. You're right on track with that. Why do we bother in the first place? Do you have an idea, Jenna? Okay. So, so, like, you can't, you can't, the reason effect size is important is because you can't really compare studies that have different, like, different variances. Yeah. Okay. So, maybe in order to compare A and B, you need to have those similar variances, otherwise you can't really compare. Yeah, right. It's really hard to compare these two. It's really hard to compare their difference in means when they are sitting in wildly different variances. I wonder if I can give it to you uh, this way. Um, so right now there's this, this camera that I've set up in the back of the room that's helping me uh, record and uh, seeing what, uh, what I might do differently in the classroom and so forth. I'm always looking to do that, even though I've been doing this for 13 years. I'm about, I'll, I'll make up a number. I'm about 20 feet um, east of that camera. The, the sun rises on this side of the campus. The sun sets on that side of the So I'm about 20 feet east of that camera. Who's okay with that? People are right, all right? So how many feet away is that from me? How many feet? 20, okay. And how many feet away am I from it? Okay, so it's, it's the same number two times. It's 20 feet from there to here and 20 feet from here to there. Who's okay with that? Okay, all right. Now let's talk about z-scores. Instead of measuring things in distance like feet, we'll measure things in distance like z-scores. Let's come over to this graph and we get a z-score, which is a standard deviation. Who remembers that? A z-score is a standard deviation. By gesticulation, can you show me how big a standard deviation here is in A? A has a standard deviation how big? Show me with your fingers. Okay? All right, so A's standard deviation is about that big. So if I were to go from A over to, let's say the mean were up here. If I were to go from here up here, I might need to go up three standard deviations to get there. Who's okay with that? Okay. But now over in B, I've got this huge standard deviation. Right? It's this big, and if I were to go from here down to here, I'm now only within one standard deviation. In other words, going from B to A, I might be away by one standard deviation, but going from A to B, I might be off by three standard deviations. It would be about like me saying this, that thing is 20 feet west of me, and I'm three feet east of it. Okay, that doesn't make sense, right? That's a nonsensical statement. We have to be the same distance apart. Who's following that? Okay, so we actually do have to make a fair comparison. We need to figure out what is the unit that we're measuring in. Is the unit this standard deviation or is the unit this standard deviation? And when they're wildly different, it's hard to figure out just how to express that separation in means. Do we use the smaller one? Do we use the much larger one? If they're identical to each other, it doesn't matter which one we would pick, right? Because we could... Uh, we'd have the same unit. But when they're wildly different from each other, we don't know how to express that separation in means. Do we use that separation or that separation to express this? Okay? That's a difficult thought. Right? It's a really difficult idea. But I thought we'd take a chance on that since we had so few slides in this section. Okay, why don't we move on to the next section? Lots of new ideas here. This is part three. Okay? And we're talking about cumulative type one error and post hoc tests. Lots of new information here. So we'll see what folks have to say about this. Happy to take questions on either what was clear or what was not so clear. Okay, thanks, Natalie. So, okay, right. That, that is clear, okay. Can you say just a little bit about that or get us started on it?
Yeah. Yeah. That's right, that's right. So typically we have some chance of making a type 1 error if we're comparing two means to each other. We might compare this group to this group, right? And uh, maybe we're going to reject the null hypothesis. If we do, we might be rejecting it in error. And we typically are willing to take a 5% risk that we're rejecting it in error, okay? But that's just when we have two means. When we're starting to do independent samples of NOVAs, we could have three means, we could have four, five, or 152 means, right? And so what happens then is for any particular pair that you might compare, any particular pairwise comparison that you might make, there's a 5% chance. But when you make your next one, there's also a 5% chance. You make another one, there's another 5% chance. So these 5 percentage points begin accumulating, right? And we're trying to keep our risk down at 0.5, but it looks like we're building those up uh, as we're making more and more comparisons. Anybody want to help us with the lottery example? If you remember something from the video on the lottery example? So let's see if we can do the lottery example here. We're going to pretend that I've got, in this container, I've got 100 ping pong balls. And, and each of the ping pong balls has a number on it. We'll play a lottery where you get a lottery ticket that corresponds to one of these numbered balls. Who's with me so far? Okay. I have, let's see if you can follow these numbers. I have 100 balls in here, and you have one ticket. Okay. What's your probability of having the winning number? One out of 100. Okay. Let's say I, I uh, try to favor you, and I'll say, well, you know what? I'm going to slide you two tickets. Okay, so instead of having one, you have two tickets and they're different from each other. Now what's your probability? Two out of 100. Suppose I slide you a third one. Now what's your probability? Three out, okay, so you're accumulating as you're getting sort of more chances to win the lottery. Who's okay with that? All right? So we can think of winning the lottery as maybe rejecting the null hypothesis. Right? How many, what's the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis in, in error? And that answer is typically 5%. If we play the lottery only one time, it's a 5% error. But if we play it a second time, we now have an accumulation. And if we play it a third time, we have an accumulation. And we start getting to this accumulation because when we're doing the ANOVA, we can have a lot of these comparisons to make. Right? We can have a whole lot of them. So we want to keep our risk down at 0 0.05, but we know that there's a good chance that we're going to get a significant number just by chance if we play it and play it and play it again. Who's following that intuitively? Okay. So we have to somehow control for this accumulation of type 1 error that arises for the first time this semester when we start comparing a whole bunch of means, not just two. Okay. So we have to control for that in some way. That's the idea of cumulative type 1 error. Thanks for, for bringing that up. Okay. Now, uh, the post hoc tests help us out with that. Anybody want to share with us what kinds of things the post hoc tests do uh, with respect to cumulative type 1 error? They also do something else for us these post hoc tests. Okay, thanks, Jenna. Well, they increase the number of they increase the critical value. Great, okay. Right, so normally if we're just doing one, then we might use something like the F in. We'd find the critical value that we have to beat, and we'd see if our F statistic beats that value, right? But if we now get another roll of the dice, and another roll of the dice, and another roll of the dice, and we keep on doing this many, many times, there's a good chance that we'll get up to a really big, uh, really big F value just by chance. Right? Just by chance. So what we're going to try to do then is make some correction, and you can think of this almost as a goalpost in, in football if that helps you. We can now move this back this way so that it's further out and it's harder to beat the number to beat. We can make some kind of an adjustment. And there are arguments to be had here that are statistical arguments. Some people would say, well, you should move it this far. Others would say, no, it has to be that far. And there are different statisticians. Some of them are called Chefe, Tukey, and Dunnett that have come up with different procedures to move this thing in an effort to make some kind of correction. So who's okay with that? Okay. So we're, we're, we're making that kind of correction to combat this problem that we've introduced, which is the cumulative type 1 problem. Okay? All right. Now, there's something else that the these post hoc tests help us do. Anybody want to remind us what that is? Okay, thanks. Um, I don't know this is the right this is what I sort of understood, is that um, the ANOVA tests only tell you that there are differences in the means, and then the post hoc test tells you like between which means. Perfect. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so let's just begin to summarize that. Two things the post hoc tests do for us. As we said a moment ago, they correct for cumulative type 1 error. They move this back by varying amounts, and statisticians can argue about how much, but that, that's the general idea. And Katie's got the other benefit of the post hoc test. They help us pinpoint where the difference is. Okay? Let's go back. Let's all yell it out. What was the ANOVA's theme song? One of these things is not like the others. So what the ANOVA uh, overall tells us is that if you have a bunch of means and you have a significant ANOVA, then at least one of those means is different from at least one other mean. 
Okay, and that's pretty helpful to know. What it doesn't tell us is which mean is different from which. So we have to somehow pinpoint that difference. Who's following that problem? Okay? And let's say we have 38 different means. It might be that seven, mean number 17 is different from mean number 4. And that might be the only difference that you get. How would you find that out? You'd run a series of post hoc tests. They would make this correction and they would tell you, aha, the difference is really between these two conditions or these two groups and nothing else. Okay? Let's see if we can, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, it tells you which ones are different, right? Uh -huh. And that's summarized uh, over here. Let's see if we can do it this way. So first, the postdoc tests allow us to see exactly which pairs of means differ from each other. Okay. And then second, the postdoc tests control for cumulative type one error. And those are the two ideas. We have a couple of minutes left. Not a whole lot of time, but enough to make it through this example. For those of you who have an interest in health psychology, you might be uh, intrigued to know about cholesterol levels and maybe how these vary across your lifetimes. Right now you're young adults. In not too many years you'll be middle-aged adults. And then a few years after that you'll be older adults. We can take a cross-sectional sample though to save some time and we can look at the cholesterol count. That's our dependent variable way up there. Okay? And we can compare the cholesterol levels for young versus middle-aged, young versus older, and then we can compare all these pairwise analyses and see where the differences might be. And we'll be looking for the sig values that we see here. Okay? And if we're making a post hoc adjustment and we're using the Tukey test as our post hoc adjustment, we might be moving this back a bit out into the critical region a little further. And even after having made the Tukey adjustment, we get a significant difference between the young people like you and middle-aged people like me, and also between the young people and the older people. Okay, those, those are significant differences. So we know that the young folks are actually different. That's given by our sig value here. We can also compare, for example, the middle-aged people to the older people and that turns out to be not significant. Okay? So we can ask in these three groups, younger, middle-aged, older, where are the differences, if any? And what this postdoc test is telling us that even after having made the adjustment, the younger people have lower cholesterol levels, significantly so, than their middle-aged counterparts and their much older counterparts. And those two groups don't differ from each other. Who's following that? Okay, so that helped us to pinpoint that. And then you can make a slightly different adjustment using Chef A. You'll wind up with slightly different values out here. Sometimes that'll make a difference. Sometimes you'll come to the same conclusion anyway. Okay. All right, we're just about out of time. So thank you for your good participation today. Look forward to having our conversation tomorrow where we'll talk a little bit more about F-tables and basic ratios. We'll get back to Natalie's question of how do we compute the between subjects and within subjects variability. Have a great day. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. Okay, so, so with this one, um, the reason it was messing me up is so I was thinking, okay, so the test of independence and null, uh, the null hypothesis would be that, um, that placebo and my new drug are independent. So wouldn't, I, wouldn't it be desirable for me um, as the owner of that company to have them be independent? Because doesn't that say that um, my drug is more efficacious than... Mm. So, yeah. so that's why I was confused because right. I know, like I have that memorized right. Right. Yeah, right, 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 right. Okay, yeah, so it's always the matter of interpretation, right? Right, so, right. so, so I was thinking, but do I want to reject it in that? So the idea is, uh, over here we have treatment, right? So we have placebo and, placebo and uh, experimental group, right? Okay. And then we might have outcomes, of course, where we don't have a quantitative or continuous variable, but we have improved or not improved, right, right. is the idea. Right? Right. And we're hoping that there is an association. We're hoping that the, the people who get the, the Jenna Grant drug are actually getting better. They're way up here, okay. right? So we want there to be an association. Okay, so, so we I want to be able to reject the association, association between drug and placebo, whereas I want I was I should have been thinking of the association between drug and approved and not. Approved. That's right. So so one of those okay. is the IV and one of those is the DV. It sounds to me like you were you were looking at an association between two levels of the I IV. Think I right, was. Okay. All right. Okay. okay that makes all sense. right. Okay. 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 Thank you. All right. Thanks for asking. Hi, Natalie. Yeah, you know what you can do if you'd like. I've got some sign up on my sign up sheets on my uh, door. If you want to sign yourself up, okay. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Thank you for doing that. Hi, Maddie. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? 
are you? All right. Um, I just want to let you know that I think I'm going to play class like maybe 10 minutes early on Friday. Okay. Um, so I have to go to a swim meet. Oh, wow. I didn't know yours. Do we have other swimmers in here? Um, no, I'm not actually a swimmer. I'm like their team manager, so <laughs> I like, travel with another meets because my sister swims here. She does? Yeah. Okay. So, Do I, what's your sister's last name? Uh, uh, Willingham. Well, just like yours. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So sometimes siblings have different names, but okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I, I thought I might know that swimmer, but I don't. So, all right, well, good of you to manage. Thank you for reminding me. Um, if it's not too much trouble, could you just send me an email reminder? A lot of yeah. students come to me with these one-offs because you're here all the time. <laughs> and then I, I might say to myself, do you, you know what? But that's fine. Mm -hmm. That'll be no trouble at all. Okay, all right, thank thanks you. for letting me know. Hey Kim. All right. Hi Rachel. Hi, how are you? Hey. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if any of those work or if you want to try a different week that works or something. Yeah. It doesn't matter if this is your pre-registration. That's okay. That's all right. Uh, I just need to um, leave those up. You can take a time if you want. That's fine. Ah, I left my camera running inside. <laughs> Pardon me. And like right at the corner of my street, like you live there, and you're oh, having this big like grab party. Okay, see you.